<laughs> what a little bit of uh, interference, it sounds like. Do you hear that also? Yeah. Okay, if it gets too bad, it might be worth having you disconnect and log back on. Um, all right. Um, quadrilateral means what? Four sides. Okay. So, on this, even though it takes some time, I'm going to suggest that you pretty much usually try to draw the points. Uh, you don't need to. After we do the problem, you'll realize there was an easier way, but let's just do it. And you don't need to make a real fine grid. You just need to approximate the point. Okay, that's W. X is 5, 4, which is parallel with W by parallel, I mean parallel to the x-axis. Y is 4 comma 1. Well, there's approximately 4 comma 1. And the only trouble with drawing a picture like this is it takes a long time. And Z is 1 comma 1. What is the area of this quadrilateral? That ends up being a parallelogram. What's the area of a parallelogram? Isn't it just... Isn't it just... Wait. Base Wait. times height? Yes. Okay, so what's the base? Three. What's the height? It's the vertical height, not the slant height. That height right there. Well, what is that height there? Three also. This height of the dotted line is the difference between the y coordinates. That's all it is. So it's 3. So the area is 9. Not particularly hard to figure out if you draw the complete picture. The question is, is it worth the extra minute it took me to draw that picture? Or could I just kind of imagined where those points were going to be and knew that the base is the dis difference between the x coordinates, both w and x and y and z, and the height is the difference between the y coordinates, and, and in both cases it's 3. So I could have really done this without drawing the picture, but it would have been much harder. I don't know about you, but it's hard for me to think of uh, what this thing looks like just looking at the four coordinates. Yeah. But, on the other hand, you're only allowed, of course, we're in the hard question part, so it's not unreasonable to expect to take a couple of minutes for these harder questions. you got to average one minute per question which means these harder questions are going to take two or three minutes, which means you better be able to do the easy questions in 15 to 30 seconds on average.
Tell you what, there's a couple of ways to do this problem. We could do it graphically. We could lay out some x coordinates. There's one, two, three, four. And each x coordinate is three more than twice the y coordinate. Well, let's lay out one, two, three, four. X coordinate is three more than twice the Y coordinate. So when X is five, Y must be one. Right? Yeah. X coordinate is three more than twice. So three more than twice one is five. Okay. So all we need is one more point to get the slope. All right. So six must be three more than twice the Y coordinate. Six must correspond with one and a half, right? Yeah. What's the slope between those two points? Rise over run. It would just be one half. Yes. Rise over run. The rise is one half. Between there and there is one half. And the run between there and there is one. So we can do it that way. Now, let me suggest another way that's probably a little faster. And that's let's write this as an equation and then translate it to y equals mx plus b. So if I'm writing this as an equation, I've got x is equal to 3 more than twice y. Okay? So that's the equation of that line. Well, can I figure out slope from that? If I put it into y equals something... I'm going to subtract 3, so I got x minus 3 equals 2y. I'm going to divide both sides by 2, and that's what y is equal. x minus 3 over 2. Do you see where the slope of that is 1 half? Yeah. Because that translates into y equals 1 half x minus 3 halves. And there's your slope. So... This might be the easier way to do it. I tend to think it is. My first inclination was to do this by just setting up the equation and solving it for y. Uh, but this is pretty tricky, and, and I don't know. I'm not sure one is better than the other. Which, which one is better is the one that you can do fastest. Of course, you don't know that in advance, so that can be a little tricky of a problem to figure out. All right. I've got, eh, let's draw the XY plane first instead of the circle first. First point, minus 4 plus 4, I'm going to put right there. Second point is 0 minus 2. Those are the endpoints of a diameter that makes up a circle. They want the radius of that circle. So what do we need to do? Find the slope of the line. Not the slope. That's not going to help us. The radius is going to be half of the distance between this and this. Oh, so find the length of the line. Uh, so. Exactly, and then we'll take half of it to be our radius. So what's the distance formula? The distance between any two points in the xy plane. Is that 
uh, y1. Uh huh. Well, almost. Uh, y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. That's slope. Here's the way I want you to think of distance. Distance is the hypotenuse of a triangle that I would draw if I were to complete that picture. Now what's distance? Think of the Pythagorean theorem. Remember, it always starts square root of. When you are solving a right triangle, and this is indeed a right triangle, for any side, the answer starts square root of. So square root of, and what goes in the middle? Under the radical. You had wow. it pretty close. I'm going to write it a couple of different ways. First of all, this is the way I like writing it the best. The change in the x, in other words, this distance right here is, is that side point? of the triangle. What's that? Is it change in x over change in y? No. What's the Pythagorean theorem say? The hypotenuse of a right triangle is the square root of one side squared plus the other side squared. Oh. Well, what is delta x? Delta x is x sub 2 minus x sub 1, but really we're going to square it, so we don't care if we come up with a positive number or a negative number. Delta y is y sub 2 minus y sub 1 squared. Well, what's x sub 2 minus x sub 1, which is to say, what is this distance right here? Like I said, I don't care if it's negative or positive because I'm going to square it anyway. So it'd be four and six, four squared and then six squared, which is sixteen and thirty-six square root of fifty-two. We don't see that on there. Why is that? Because you simplify it. Okay. What does that simplify to? Now, at this point, you do have a couple of options. You can put that in a calculator and figure out what the number is. And then you can go put each of these five answers in your calculator and figure out which one matches this one. Right? Yeah. So even if you don't know how to simplify this radical, this is a situation where your calculator would help. But let's try to simplify this radical. What divides into that number? What's a factor of 52 that's a perfect square number? Four. Yeah, four. So 52 is the square root of 4 times the square root of 13. Well, that becomes the number 2 root 13. So we get the answer that's on the test by simplifying that. Whereas if we tried doing it the other way, you would have to do that calculation, and then you'd have to do all five of these on your calculator before you found the one that was even close. They purposely put that as E to slow down people who are doing it the hard way. The hard way being the calculator way. The calculator way is the slow way here. It's easier to do this, as long as you're good at factoring. All right. These are fairly hard. Which is good, because I think you're going to do fine on the easy problems and the medium problems. You and I should focus on the hard problems. Now, in a question like this, you're just going to have to start at the top, 
and go through each one until you find one that not only is true, but has to be true, no matter what X, Y, and Z are. It says they're real numbers, which means they could be rational, irrational, integers, fractions, basically anything. The only thing this says is that the product, all three of them, is equal to 1. Is F true? No. Well, what happens if I algebraically solve this? X, Y, Z equals 1. I divide both sides by Z, and I get yeah. X, Y equals 1 over Z. So it's definitely true. It's only one part of it that bothers me. What if Z were zero? No, no, it wouldn't work. Ah, but can Z be zero? If Z were zero, you'd have the product of three numbers, one of which is zero. That's always equal to zero. So Z cannot be zero, nor can X, nor can Y. So not only is that true, it has to be true. In other words, we got that by just an algebraic manipulation. This thing here is identical to this thing there. Okay. Okay. And at this point, we're really done. There's no reason to waste the time looking at G, H, J, and K. You certainly do not want to satisfy your curiosity by disproving each of these four other things. That'll take two minutes to do. We found one that's always true. Let's right. go on to the next. Next page. Apologize for the blurriness on this. Let's see if I can translate where we have to. The average of a set of seven integers, whole numbers, is 24. When an eighth number is included in the set, the average goes to 31. What's the eighth number? Is H eighty? Um, yeah. Oh yes, it is. Yeah, it's thirty-one, fifty-five, eighty, one sixty-eight, two sixteen. This requires a principle that I try to tell every single student I have that's taking the ACT test to think about whenever they see a problem that's about averages. The problem is not solved by looking at the averages. The problem is solved by looking at the totals. You want to do totals. I have yet to see a problem about averages that doesn't mean totals. You have to solve this problem by finding totals. What's the total of these seven integers? A plus, well, let's go through it. This oh. is very important. A plus B plus D plus E plus F plus G divided by 7 equals 24. What's the total of those seven integers? 24. No, the total yeah. divided by 7 is 24. Remember, they told us the average is 24. And you get the average by adding them all up and dividing by how many there are. Right. So, what is that alone equal to?
would have to be 168. Correct. So that total is 168. Now, let's look at the second part of the problem. When an eighth number is added, the average goes to 31. Well, let's add an eighth number, z. And when I divide that by 8, that's equal to 31. So what must these total be? Two forty-eight. What's Z going to have to be? In other words, the total of A through G was 168. The total of A through Z is 248. What is Z? 80. That's it. Notice that at no point in time did we even mention the averages. You do not want to try to compare 24 with 31. That is never the way to go about solving average problems or mean problems. You'll see one of those two words. You'll either see average or mean. And when you see that word in a problem, know that you need totals. They don't give you the totals, but when they give you the number of items, 7, and their average is 24, that allows you to calculate the total. Same thing with after you have 8 of them in there. All right. Okay. A little geometry problem. Uh, it's blurry, but we should still be able to make it out. This says 40 degrees. This says 2B degrees. This says B degrees. And this says C degrees. So... They want to know what C is. So 2B is 50. So B is 25. Hold on, you're, you're, you're on to something, but I think you're off just a little bit here. We know 2B is 50, so B is 25, so this whole angle is what? 75. Okay, so now we're looking at a triangle that's 40, 75, what's that angle? Remember what the best skill in geometry is, is to be able to subtract a number from 180. You're always doing it. When you're solving triangles, you do it. When you're solving supplementary angles, you do it. Would it be 65? Uh-huh. That's a typical geometry problem in the sense that you're never going to solve these directly. There's always going to be an intermediate step. In other words, we just know by looking at it that we're going to have to solve for this before we can solve for this over here. Yeah. And there was actually a little bit of a shortcut. Once you know that B is 25, now you know B and C are complementary. Right? Because that's a right angle. That's also a right angle. So this is still a right triangle. So we really didn't need to add 40 plus both of those and subtract that from 180 is all we needed to really do was take 25. What's complementary to 25? 65. Would have been a little quicker. All right, let's do one more here. This says the ratio of L to M is 3 to 4, and the ratio of P to M is 1 to 2. What's the ratio of L to P? There's two ways to do this problem. 
There's the way you can do it if you want to set it up algebraically. But if my life depended on it, if somebody gave me this problem and they said, you're going to die if you don't get it right, I would tend to want to pick some numbers. I would want to pick an L and an M that was in a 3 to 4 ratio. And then I would want to pick a P and an M that was in a 1 to 2 ratio. And then I would compare my L number to my P number to figure out what that ratio was. Let's just try that before we do the algebraic way. Give me an L and an M that is in a, a 3 to 4 ratio. Pick, pick any number you want. Keep them small. 6. 6 for L, what's for M? 8. Right, okay. Now, let's find a P that's 1 to 2 with M. What must P be? 4. And now, what's the ratio of L to P? 3 to 2. Correct. And that's all. That's the easiest, quickest way to solve the problem. Now let's back up a moment and say, well, let's decide, let's pick the smallest numbers you can think of, three and four. Okay. Well, now P would be two, right? Yeah. Well, now L to P doesn't even require any reduction. It's three to two. I don't want to bypass the algebraic way, so let me just show you how that would work. L to M is 3 to 4. P to M is 1 to 2. So if I were to solve this, and, and they want the ratio of L to P, so if I can somehow manipulate this so that I get a P in the bottom... Well, I can do that by solving this for M. Cross multiply, you get M equals 2P. And now, instead of M, let's put 2P in there. Well, they want, what is L over P? I got to multiply both sides by 2. You get L over P equals 6 over 4, which is equal to 3 over 2. So the pure algebraic way to do it is probably, I don't know, some people do fine when they have to put it into an algebraic equation and solve, but other people kind of freeze up and they don't know the, the way to translate that to algebra. Well, if that's the case, you can always do it the first way we did it, which is to pick numbers. Pick any numbers you want for L and M and make sure they're in a 3 to 4 ratio and then figure out what P has to be then compare L to P. That's actually the most easiest way to look at this problem. All right. Good stopping place. Mitch, I will talk to you next week. All right. All right. Bye-bye.